The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Skinny are helping you show how smart you are with the 1Q Quiz, an all-new, super-challenging and super-quick daily quiz built by The Spin-Off. Every Monday, Skinny are giving you the chance to prove you're smart with the Skinny Extra Credit question. Get it right and you'll get the chance to score yourself some Skinny Extra mobile credit so you can text, call or even video call your group chat and gloat about how big your brain is. T's and C's apply. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. No my hockey my kia the fold e mihi nei ko Duncan Grieve talking about my guest this week is someone I've wanted to have on the fold for a long long time. Uh, his name is Matt Bale. Uh, Matt, someone I've known since before the spin-off started. He he founded a digital media company called MBM, which he and his co-founder Sean McCready sold out of in in 2019, and he actually just finished up there at the end of last year. But and and what car- what what's interesting about MBM is really kind of you know aside from what's interesting about Matt, uh, it it was the first big play into into digital. Media buying, media agencies are something which honestly I didn't even know about before founding the spinoff. I probably should have, but um, basically they take the big budgets of uh, of you know, New Zealand businesses and organisations and decide where to put the the kind of great creative work that comes out of ad agencies. And in so doing, they have like a an outsized influence on you know because this is a, a very advertising funded industry. They, you know, by putting more with a YouTube or a Facebook versus a Trade Me or a Stuff.co.nz, they have quite a, a an outsized impact on what we see, how it's funded. Um, and that's why I think, you know, and because that is so, you know, increasingly data informed, um, that, uh, you know, I think that that journey from, uh, from a sort of a legacy world where there was a lot of guesswork to a you know the, a much more complex media environment, uh, yeah, that that's that's basically been the story of Matt's career. It was the original sort of founding idea of, of MBM, and it's it's really the meat of what we talk about here. Is you know Matt entered this this industry in 1996, and you know left it 26 years later, utterly transformed. Not that, not that he did that, but that was that was an era that he lived through. And the other reason I wanted to have him on is that we, it feels, and this is, I think, the third or the fourth podcast this year, which touched on, touches on this, as if we're on the verge of another great change in in the sort of internet slash technology space, and that's the rise of generative AI. Um, Matt's authority to speak on that is not just that he, you know, his business became increasingly engaged with um, deep technology and machine learning through, over the course of its existence, but particularly because he, uh, on leaving MBM, basically started doing papers at um, AI papers at Stanford and has been doing sort of crash courses and prompt engineering and has really of all the people I know who have been aware of this, probably been the person who's engaged most deeply at a sort of a foundational level and thought the most about where it might go. So we, we end the conversation talking about that. And and if you're sort of bored or scared by, by that idea, A, that's totally rational, but B, you'll be hopefully pleased to hear that it's a very optimistic note he strikes, particularly about the way that generative AI will will impact on uh, the, the sort of creative side of the media or the you know the the news slash entertainment side of the media but also uh, creative agencies and and I think he makes a pretty persuasive argument about why that should be the sort of the posture or, or the the sort of default uh, idea about how this must go uh, so this is Matt Bale founder of MBM on the fold. Dinakwe, Matt, and welcome to the fold. Thanks, Duncan. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm I'm really excited about this. I, you know, someone I've talked to for a, for a long time, and I think that 
you know, what what we're going to get into will basically carry the kind of sweep of of advertising its relationship with technology. Um, but I wondered if we could start almost before that about, you know, how you got into uh, the ad industry in the first place and, and almost set the scene, like describe the operating environment of the the, the business as, as you found it. Sure. So um, we have to wind back the clock to 1996. So that scares me, just saying those numbers. Um, and in truth... Um, I was a bit of a news junkie and went to Massey University prior to 96 and studied uh, media and communication and I was just one of those people who was a bit of a geek about the news industry, etc. And then um, as I was finishing, I was lucky enough through a bit of nepotism because my dad was working with Saatchi's to get an intro in there and I managed to get into the media team at Saatchi and Saatchi in 96. And it's hard to put into words how different that is to today. So, you know, we were an integrated agency. So for those who don't know, that meant the agency did creative and it also did media and it did direct mail. Do you want to just almost quickly explain the... the, I I feel like some, you know, a lot of people, you can be quite engaged with the media and not understand the distinction in some respects. Yeah, so in simplistic terms, in those days, creatives were the people who came up with the ads and media were the people who placed them, so either in radio, television, outdoor, magazines, etc. And then there was another um, field, direct mail or DM, direct marketing, whose job it was to get it into people's letterboxes, in truth. Um, and over time, those things morphed, so the discipline of direct mail came into the digital realm and online internet advertising. It's interesting, right? Because as I understand it, direct mail was always the sort of maligned kind of. It, it was distinctly unglamorous, and and the the sort of high arts of of creative and and media were the thing. And now it's almost flipped on its head, right? Like the the direct response, whatever is perceived or attributed to making you make that purchase, is where 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 the real value is captured now. Yeah, well, you know, you would argue that you had a complete flip of the poles. So there's been so much energy and effort put into performance marketing, which follow largely direct, you know, marketing principles. Um, and they've become real focused and brand has fallen by the wayside. Although I like to think that, you know, you're starting to see a rebalance as we enter another economic cycle. So, yeah. so in terms of that, like, like that 1996 period, that, you know, it was – not quite the peak, but fairly, you know, the peak was coming within a few years of the legacy media world as we knew it. Do you want to sort of describe, you know, the the the, the media as it existed then and how you, as a proxy for the advertising industry, interacted with it? Yeah, sure. So um, from a media planning point of view, there were three free-to-air TV channels, so TV1, TV2, TV3. There was Sky. I think in those days they had five channels. Um, and in 96, I think they were in about a third of homes. So they were still a long way away from, you know, 50% of households where they peaked. Um, there were, from memory, 27 daily newspapers across New Zealand. Um, there were still some evening newspapers in 96, so the Evening Post in Wellington, um, Manitou Evening Standard in Palmerston North, etc. There were a whole heap of radio stations and there were more independent radio stations than there are now. So there's been a lot of consolidation into two main players in radio. There were a lot of independent stations in local markets. Um, yeah, and it's amazing when you think back about that was, and then some outdoor, which in those days they called it the cowboy industry, so it was anyone who just slapped up a billboard on a piece of land, and there was so many different operators, etc. most having between you know one and five sites. There wasn't a lot of uh, you know mass reach in, a, in terms of site portfolios, etc. So it was really different, and we were incredibly busy on that limited number of media channels, and you wind the clock today where there's almost unlimited channels. And we're still really busy, so I don't know what we were doing. <laughs> I mean, in 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 terms of the sort of relationship between uh, me, media and all of those kind of basically related industries, 
you know, how how did you know how how did you sort of interact and how did you know where to put things? You know, what was the the sort of data and the survey and you know and that side of the business, which I assume was where a lot of you know your money was earned, was was kind of knowing things and connecting the the brand and through them the creative to to the audience, which could be plausibly claimed by these various uh, you know pieces of media. Yeah, well, I mean, it's really interesting to think about that whole my whole career, if you like. Uh, the simplest way of explaining it is if you think about advertising as a subset of marketing, being a combination of arts and science. My whole time in the industry, the science end of the spectrum was growing quite rapidly. Um, because in the early days, there wasn't a lot of science. <clears throat> um, you know, uh, television had people meters, and so it had uh, what in the business we call TARP, so target audience rating points. You would have heard, you know, common lexicon and how things rated, etc. That's what was used. That was in very few households. I kind of think from memory about 500 households in 96 determined the ratings for TV shows. Um, and in those days, uh, it spat out on one of those classic dot matrix printers with the, the holes down the side and the gold bars. It spat out the ratings for the previous uh, night's television or day's television at 10 o'clock. So if that printer jammed or didn't work, that was it. Um, so, you know, you go that, you look at that then, so many decisions were made on that dot matrix printer's um, outputs. And that was generally, you know, driven by 500 ha- households. So in terms of that, you know, that that, that that explains the TV part of it. But, you know, how... How closely contested what was was all that, and and how how big proportionally were the different buckets? If you have think about TV, newspapers, magazines, outdoor, etc. If you think about a, say a, a dollar of spend, how would have that been divided up at that time? Yeah, very differently to now. Um, you know, in some ways, uh, it was a lot more even. So newspapers commanded a significant amount of the pie. Um, I think in 96 it probably had the largest share of the pie, um, followed by television and radio. New, radio in New Zealand has always had a larger slice than other markets. I think it's a factor of we have a lot of radio stations and we have, you know, um, a lot of area where, you know, radio is good for because of provincial and rural, et cetera. So radio has always done well. But newspapers were really strong print per se, but, you know, um, Newspapers were a lot of the lot of the volume, and in truth, there was limited in terms of the science. There was very limited decisions being made on it. So, you had um, the ABC who provided circulation and estimated uh, readership, and we had um, studies, typically annual, that gave us a view about how many were, people were reading Section A, the front half of the newspaper, how many people were reading sport. Etc. And so you use those to sort of infer um, the price differential of a section A versus being in world or section B, etc. But it was, you know, there wasn't a lot of empirical science um, in '96 at all. Um, and like, you know, most of these decisions had been made mainly over, you know, long periods of time. They'd sort of got pattern orientated in truth. Um, I mean, I can remember when. In 96, when I was at Saatchi's and the media team there, we were working on uh, telecom, what became Spark, and we were just starting out to think about some more um, different ways of looking at things. So rather than just TARPs, ratings, look how many ratings we got for X amount of dollars, we started to think about business outcomes. So how many TARPs drove how many, um, oh, 100 calls, for example. And then we suddenly realised, well, TARPs is a pretty blunt measure. Um, it's a currency, really. So how many people did we have to reach to generate so many 100 calls? And then if we kind of work that out, could we get to a point where we could forecast? So if we spent X amount of dollars, got so much reach on the weekends when Telecom did a talkathon, could we estimate how many people actually might ring? Australia for a $10 talkathon in those days, etc. So that was, I mean, that seems so logical now, but those were very early days of actually applying science to the art of advertising. 
That's so interesting. And, and you know, a lot of that has now become kind of, you know, if you were doing marketing for a software as a service company, for example, that would be your sort of default baseline is, is, is figuring out what you can know based on that kind of return on investment, right? Yeah. And, you know, I guess as the world digitized further and further, a lot of those things um, have become, you know, normalized, right? Understanding your, your cost per acquisition or, you know, cost per contact, etc. But in 1996, where most of the media was broadcast and with limited one or two year surveys or a small sample size, those, those scientific methods just weren't prevalent. Yeah, I guess um, it would have been very hard to, to figure out at the best of times. Thinking um, about the rise of the internet, 1996, it's very much dial up. Penetration might have been 15, 20% of households in New Zealand, maybe yeah. a little bit higher. I think a little bit higher, but not massive. Yeah. I mean, in, in 96, to give you an example, you know, at, at the ad agency, we had an internet room. So a room with a terminal, you know, an internet connection. So, you know, it wasn't long before it was rolled out into everyone's desktop computers. Um, but in, you know, in 1996, we had an internet room where people would go in there and, and get on the internet. Yeah. That's wild. So just thinking about the the sort of, because ultimately you, you would go on to, to found, a, you know, an agency kind of fairly explicitly predicated on understanding digital away, in a way that bigger agencies didn't. How do you recall it sort of slowly penetrating the 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 media world over the sort of intervening 10, 15 years? Well, in some ways, I had a real advantage personally because as the internet and digital activity was taking off here in New Zealand, um, the benefits of New Zealand uh, were really helpful for me. And what I mean by the benefits is, you know, I can remember walking down um, maybe two blocks and going uh, going up and seeing the guys who were doing Trade Me, who had just sort of started it, and having a chat to them about, could I put an ad on their homepage? And they were like, oh, wow, yeah, um, let's have a talk about that. And, you know, we ended up, Sean and myself ended up putting Westpac on the um, homepage of Trade Me. Now, that's because we could do that. We could walk two blocks introduce ourselves and, and, you know, have a conversation. What that meant was by the time I actually left New Zealand and worked in Australia and worked in the UK, um, I was amazed that uh, they actually were at a much more trial and experimentation stage of digital than we were in New Zealand because the adoption was actually quite quick, you know, um, the ability to do that sort of stuff, whereas in the UK where the budgets were huge, they were much more hesitant to shift money and they didn't have much experience. So I can remember my boss saying, you know, how many interactive campaigns have you done? And I, you know, I was like, oh, I don't know, maybe 200. And he was like, what? You know, <laughs> you're lying. You know, I was like, oh, no, you know, do about, you know, 20 a week back home. And he just couldn't believe it because there wasn't, that wasn't happening. And then that changed while I was in London. And we had, of course, through that period, the dot-com bubble and then burst, et cetera, the false dawn of e-commerce and WAP and all of those things. But I was really lucky because at the early stages of that, New Zealand actually was a pretty quick adopter um, and we were doing small but lots. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was that. And then from that through my career, as I said, the science end of the spectrum just kept growing, um, driven by digital and digital technology. Um, and I can remember, like, you know, immediately seeing social media Although in those days, you know, you'd argue it was MySpace, Bebo and Facebook um, and going, wow, like the genie's out of the bottle here and we spent a lot of time thinking about, because they didn't tell you, how did the algorithm work, for example? Um, what could we do to generate, you know, bigger impacts from the algorithm? So an example of that is typically um, digital campaigns were planned over quite a long time frame, so say seven days, your budget split over a week. And we realised that one of the inputs in the early days of social was recency. So the the algorithm was looking for stuff that was lots of people were talking about at, you know, all at once. So what did we do? We took the media budget and loaded it up into six hours. And so now all of a sudden 
it was seeing that lots of people were talking about it, so it was releasing more organic reach, et cetera. Um, so understanding algorithms and, and that was really interesting. The, you know, the, it's hard to put in context how big a role Google has had through this period. I mean, Google is huge. I mean, and, you know, I'd say in New Zealand probably close to 50 cents in every dollar, in America even more. Um, and so really understanding the Google ecosystem, and, you know, and by that I mean search and cloud and all of those sort of things, became a really important part of my development. Um, and then that led me on to machine learning, which I'm, you know, everyone who knows me out there will be laughing. I'm not an expert in it, but understanding the principles of machine learning um, led me on to deep learning, which led me on to AI, which I'm, I'm currently studying. So that's the journey there. Yeah, But at the same time, and, you know, it makes me sound like I'm a, a digital zealot. The, the My whole career has been defined by the magic between um, creative and media. So uh, when you work with creators and media people really closely, the nexus of those two things is all the best moments of my entire career. All the best campaigns have been driven by creativity, so the art and the science, not just one end of the spectrum. And it's interesting. So there's quite quite a lot in there. So I'll just sort of break it down into pieces a bit. Thinking about that um, that sort of shift from because if you look at in 1996, it was essentially all all legacy. Now, well, I don't know what proportion of spend you'd probably have a much better idea about what the kind of current progress bar is in terms of that shift. Broad bucket digital online social is taken over from legacy completely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and you know. Um, you know, newspapers are a small percentage now, magazines, you know, TV is shrinking. So, yeah, it's changed completely. And and so there must have been kind of moments along that way where, you know, broadly speaking, the sort of behaviour got out ahead of the spend and, you know, like where there was a sort of a period of convincing you know, large numbers of participants in that market that, that they needed to to move or at least consider this thing. How, how, how you know, has that, did that process kind of go for you over over time? Um, well, you know, I, I think in the, in the very early days of uh, digital, it was, it was such a low, um, such a low barrier to entry that actually, it wasn't that hard to convince people to let us try advertising on Trade Me or, you know, and the same applied actually with Facebook. I think the very first Facebook campaign I did, I, you know, ended up getting approval and putting $50 on my own credit card. So it was a low barrier. Sure. The, the, the bigger jumps come when you actually think that, you know, having done some small-scale experience, that you should really shift some serious money around. That becomes really hard. Um, and to be honest... Um, you know, it, a lot of it was driven on, um, you know, human uh, desire not to change. So you know, even when we had empirical evidence that, you know, measures were, were changing because we had shifted some money, there was always a, a hesitancy uh, to change. But um, my view is, you know, you're either, um, you're either early or you're late on some of that stuff. And, you know, clients who were brave enough you know, really leap into social or search engine marketing. You know, they were able to they were able to see that success, and th- and they talked about it, and that changed other clients' viewpoints quite quickly. Um, yeah, but I mean, a lot of it was um, about education, to be honest. So, how did you find that those kind of legacy media platforms responded? to that you know because even even now you have institutions like sort of think tv which are sort of functionally lobbying for a particular approach to things which is all entirely understandable but there's and and it's not like literally every kind of any, anyone who's selling media in the world has has got a vested interest in telling a particular story about what they're doing but yeah do you, do you sort of look back on various kind of moments and, and inflection points and or, or in terms of that that shift and think that you know there were 
times when rather than resisting, they could have learned? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, we uh, I could yeah we could have a whole series on that. Um, so you know, um, well let, let's run through a few. So newspapers. I mean, everyone who was in the media buying game. So actually buying space, mm. we, we we couldn't understand what newspapers would were, were doing. So what I mean by that is they were letting the classified business just run out the door, and and you know that was such an important component of subsidising the creation of news and thus newspapers. We, we couldn't understand it at the time. So that, that's the one that basically walked into to trade me and um, got a lot more efficient and. Yeah. Outcome based as a yeah, result. Well, walked into trade, not just trade me alone, though, but walked into Google, of course, mm. you know. Um, yeah. And, and they, you know, they tended to have an ideologically driven view, which was, well, that's okay. You know, what matters is the, is the story, news. Yeah. Without an understanding that that's not financially yeah. how a newspaper operated. Yeah. Um, um, so, so that was. I mean, we used to almost have stand up fights with with people that you know, uh, um, I now about this is crazy, you know, um, and they either they knew and were ignoring it, or well, they just didn't see it. In truth, um, so that was newspapers, um, you know, magazines. So magazines is a, a you know, magazines are, is a fun, you know, is a, an amazing touch point, right? And you know, the old adage that you know. People really trust the editors of you know their magazines, and they have a real affinity. And you know the amount of time they spent reading them—that's all true. But you know, magazines were really hesitant and slow to want to embrace digital content at all. And you know, I think back now, going, I wonder if what we knew then, if in the early days, some of these magazines had really embraced thinking about digital-based content, how different the magazine industry might look. Um, because you know they had, they understood really well their readers, and mm. they spent a lot of time thinking about it. And their editors had that feel on it. What they missed there was they just missed that the distribution points were changing, um, and you know they they weren't able to react quick enough. How, how much of that is just that? You know, does this come back to ad products and and the way that you know things like display advertising basically got you know a lot of the the kind of connection chain and therefore ultimately the you know a significant chunk of the sense sense in the dollar was captured by companies like DoubleClick which eventually became owned by Google and uh, you know the the distribution parts became more powerful than the actual brands that sort of sat at the end of them yeah I definitely think that's true I think also for a period there you know um the you know unfortunately the last click drove some actions and what I mean by that is you know um, whatever ad people last clicked on is where where the um, uh, advertising dollars flowed to. Now you know in hindsight we all know that's wrong. Like you know just because I clicked on the ad doesn't mean I it wasn't actually because of some other journey or you know my mate told me something and I should think about it etc. And what that did though in those early days is drove you know, a lot of money into Google and therefore probably suffocated the ability for, you know, some magazines to drive a revenue stream to enable a distribution change, for sure. So let's sort of sort of pause on that for a minute because, you know, if I think about where the sort of value sits in that kind of thing, for, for example, um, I have actually bought one. I don't know if I ever will, but like I read a, a review of a BYD, you know, the, the Japanese electric car maker, car on business desk and it sort of was the first time I'd properly engaged with this brand and it sort of seemed like you know just quite interesting in multiple ways and yet were I to take that latent interest and and turn it into a test drive that's you know the, a sponsored link is going to sit at the top of, uh, of any BYD search query I'm assuming that's a very high value Google search string because cars are a very expensive purchase and yet really that is functionally or it's a really a real estate play as opposed to having any meaningful role the only reason they're paying for it in some respects is probably to avoid a competitor camping there and you know somehow distracting me with with their own um, EV dooms, patch yeah. you know like when, when you look at that 
to what extent does that sort of still define, you know, is there still a kind of a, a broad misconception about where kind of value sits as opposed to, to a kind of a more basic sort of real real estate sort of slash sales piece? Oh, I would, you know, I would say it's evolving. I would say it's not, um, it's still not crystal clear, right? And so, you know, it, it's, it's, you're not able to kind of map out you know, Duncan Greaves' customer journey and understand exactly where. So, you know, you, you can have customer journey models and you can understand some weightings, you know. Um, but, yeah, it's it's not scientific to the to the exact point. But, you know, um, having said that, the, you know, the thinking about it has got a lot better from, oh, because Duncan clicked on the search term, that, that should get all the money because that, that, obviously, that's the thing that did yeah. it. When in fact, all that is all, was was the last piece of the chain. Yeah, and understanding like you know the role of destination and discover discoverability across a consumer journey. So what I mean by that is, you know, it is consumer actions to go. Oh, well, I'll put in the search term and and do it. But that's because they're showing search intent because of everything that came before it. So. Yeah understanding that, well, if you want to continue to have a pipeline, you need to think about everything that came before the Everything that ultimately built, yeah. built, uh, built that intent. So let's, let's um, turn now to the founding of MBM. What, what motivated that and, and how did the market initially respond to the appearance of this quite, you know, quite radical and in some respects uh, entity appearing in the middle of, of, of a fairly established group of, um, you know, existing uh, businesses? Um, so it was 2010, um, so the GFC was uh, in play. So I didn't realise it at the time, but that was probably um, really fortuitous. Um, yeah, everyone else thought I was uh, we were a little bit mad to launch in the GFC. Um, what happened was both Sean McCready and myself um, – had for this at this by this point worked for multinational um, you know big companies so you know Sean had worked for WPP and BBDO or OMG and I'd worked for I was at OMD then and I'd, so I'd worked for Omnicom and I'd worked for Starcom and I'd worked for such and such etc so we had a lot of experience um, running media departments or media teams or media units um, and I guess. We both felt at that time that things were really changing and they were changing really fast, but that the models to how we were uh, engaging with the media and clients and creatives weren't really changing. And to be honest, everyone has always asked us what was our grand strategy or plan. I mean, our view was simply that we thought we could that we could do it a little bit better. Um, and yeah, so we set out to think about what that would look like. Um, I kind of think from memory, Sean, if you're listening, you'll, you'll tell me if I'm wrong. I kind of think we planned sort of a, a bit of a three-year view on it and what we would need and how we'd have to do it. And then we just sort of got down to doing it, in truth. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that we were, you know, master visionaries. We we got lucky by being in the GFC. So what what happened then was particularly local New Zealand businesses who are up against multinational or Australian competitors, you know, their budgets were getting squeezed, you know, it was a tricky time for them. So they were looking for something different. And in truth, we were fresh kid on the block offering something different. Um, and the other thing is both me and Sean came out of integrated, um, as I said, integrated advertising agencies. So that gave us a unique ability. We know how to converse with creative teams and – at that time, creative teams were really struggling with this whole new world of media, and we knew how to talk to them, and therefore, for them really to be able to, you know, step up and, and really engage on it. And equally, we knew how to talk to clients. So, yeah. When you when you sort of think back over that span, are there moments which, yeah, you know, or is there a specific moment which stands out where you sort of whether it was a particular client or campaign that really sort of bet on what you were sort of the, the story that you were telling about the future, about where things were going in a way that sort of both validated what you were doing, but also kind of proved the integrity of, of the, that sort of new digital 
world that you were, were sort of sketching? Oh, uh, I mean, yeah. So the one that first springs to mind for me, um, so, you know, I was, I was down in Wellington, um, was, uh, you know, uh, Whitakers. So, you know, um, Whitakers were, had been really successful and I'd worked with them for a, you know, a long time. But, you know, we did an annual planning day and um, we had to find a way of, you know, kind of doing more with less than our competitors. I mean, they were outspent in those days, like, you know, nine to one by you know, the multinational chocolate brands like Cadbury's and Nestle, right? And so, you know, we, as a, as a, a royal we, we started to think about, well, you know, how can we change that dynamic? So, you know, money money can't be the thing because otherwise we're going to lose um, in a marketing sense. So we started to think about, you know, what are some fulcrums, if you like, that can really generate it. And, you know, by that stage we'd run a few experiments, just little tests, and we um, managed to show them a world where going all in on, you know, social, not abandoning traditional media at all. So, you know, a role for television and there was still a role for magazines and out at home. But why, you know, um, social primarily in those days should be the centrepiece for Whitakers and, you know, talking to Whitakers chocolate lovers, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, that, that for us was, you know, it all made sense in theory, but until someone actually, you know, gave you the golden key and, and told you to do it, could you know, could you really understand it? And and in truth, you know, it scaled really fast. Um, you know, all of a sudden we were, you know, really connected as a brand with, you know, our, our own consumers and, and an audience and, and chocolate lovers in general. Um, yeah, so that was one. Um, I can think about when we, you know, launched the Z brand in New Zealand. Again, you know, digital and social, you know, putting the CEO, so Mike Bennett, um, so a great CEO, putting him at the centre of some of the comms, so through, you know, having him on social media and ask Mike, asking, you know, answering people. I mean, in truth, the oil industry in New Zealand had been for decades uh, faceless. So, you know, you used to read the byline in newspapers and, you know, um, you know, an oil company spokesman said they didn't mm. even have their name. Mm. Um, and this idea, which you know, Mike, um, bless him, you know, he was really up for of you know, well, if the industry is faceless, well, you know, and we're we want to be a, you know an iconic New Zealand company, then the CEO should be front and centre, and people should New Zealanders should have the opportunity to ask some questions. And so you know, that that was really brave of them. I mean, you know, everyone, um, you know, success has many fathers. Afterwards, everyone, you know, well, common sense, why wouldn't you? But at the time, I can remember there was, you know, there was a lot of stomach tightening from me. Have I, <laughs> have I, have I made a horrendous mistake here just pushing the idea of, you know, a CEO going and do, for, you know, going and doing QA? But yeah. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa, with over 4,000 out of home advertising sites nationwide across both street furniture and retail centres. I'm super grateful to O Media for enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, Jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. Well, one thing which you know, you, you've made reference to, to social, my, my uh, colleague Bell, Bell Hawkins, who... I only know through you who who used to work for MBM now works for our agency Daylight. She's wonderful. Uh, she is. She um, said that a lot of her early work was basically trying to figure out how to efficiently and cost effectively buy page likes, which Facebook really emphasised at the time, and then basically seemed to almost kind of destroy as a you know, in the, in the, with the end of the free reach era. How much of the, you know, with hindsight, looking back into some of the sort of default advertising behaviours in, in social environments, was was 
effective. Uh, and how much has the sort of recent kind of step change evolution of social made kind of the the um, you know the the advertising product you know more or less impactful I guess as as it sort of um, as it has changed over the years. Yeah. Um, well, to answer the, the Facebook like one first up. So, I mean, uh, the honest answer is in the early days of Facebook. Um, so it's hard for everyone to remember now, but in the early days of Facebook, it was an amazing platform if you th- really think about it because you were getting, you know, TV1 news reach numbers on organic reach. So you weren't paying for it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Um, so it, it it was a very different ecosystem. And, you know, we, and, and Bell was part of these, we used to spend, you know, an inordinate amount of time trying to understand how we could influence likes because likes would unlock organic reach and our organic reach was, you know, um, effectively free fame for clients. Um, and, you know, it was an environment where where everyone had, you know, been in a paid environment. This opportunity for earned media at amazing scale um, was phenomenal. But in truth, you know, Facebook were very clever equally. Once they had it seduced everyone on the drug of in media, they did the great switch, you know, and and then changed the platform to be, you know, pay to play. And, you know, very quickly, you know, through the the results feeds we could see, we could see, you know, over a matter of months that the power of the like, which originally unlocked earned reach, you know, earned um, exposure, was largely becoming irrelevant. It was still a measure of you know, some of a community or, you know, um, you know, affection, if you like. But, you know, to play at scale on that platform, you had to pay. And that was that was a big shift. Um, and, you know, it was a big shift for the media practitioners who were living that world. It was an even harder shift for clients who'd got used to the seduction of, wow, I'm, you know, I'm reaching hundreds of thousands of New Zealanders and I'm not having to pay a cent for it. So yeah, that that was quite a big shift. In terms of the way, like the, there was some kind of you know part of that artistry was, you know, you'll go onto this thing, a naive as a person, and be like, oh yeah, I like all of these things. Essentially, telling them this quite complex story about who you were as ultimately a consumer. As we've gone on, that has you know I think we there's a broad understanding of of the sort of how good that bargain is for one party and and um, what you sort of give up, which means that the later coming platforms, the you know, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, it's more about inference than that kind of hard mm. information. Has, does that make them sort of less effective than Facebook at its height? Like what what is the kind of the modern social environment like as distinct from the one that you were, you were talking about in those early years? I think in the early days of Facebook particularly, but no, actually also when I say that, also the early days of Instagram, which, you know, was very, you know, photo creative uh, driven in the early days, you know. Um, yes, there was a naivety. People didn't understand that, you know, exactly what was happening in a marketing context. But also, you know, in some ways the platforms um, damaged themselves. So what I mean by that is, you know, in the old world uh, of newspapers and magazines, you know, fundamentally managing directors and editorials of newspapers knew they couldn't fill the entire newspaper up with ads. You know, they talked about a ratio. And the same thing with magazines. What happened in that period of Facebook was, particularly as they led up to, you know, IPO listings and all that sort of stuff, I mean, they flooded the feeds with so many ads that, you know, it started to disconnect to the audience. I mean, you know, people who joined up there to see what their... What their friends were doing from high school these days were suddenly bombarded by, you know, um, sheer amounts of sheer volumes of ads. And in some ways, they've learned from that. So they've done a better job at trying to, you know, manage the ad load. Creatives have got smarter in terms of, you know, now the ads look less like ads and more like content. So there's been an adjustment there. But um, I mean, I would argue that the golden point of um, Facebook in terms of relationship between you know brands and, and 
and consumers was those really early days where, you know, um, consumers actually really felt like they were on a platform where they could engage with the brand and, you know, it was a real two-way street. And now I think they feel less like it's a two-way street and more that it's a, you know, it's a form of marketing. Uh, a couple of years ago, you uh, you and Sean uh, sold MBM to to yeah. publicists. 2019. So, yeah. It's a while ago now. And I think it was towards the end of, of last year that you finished up there. And instead of just sort of relaxing and looking back over this, the, the sort of thing that you made, you sort of plunged yourself into – uh, a degree, and I wondered if you could talk about what the degree is and why the f- you know that was the first thing you did upon exiting uh, this business. Um, yeah, well, um, what's the what's the honest answer to that? So, MBM had been such a a big part of my life um, that I was really conscious in the lead up to me leaving um, that, you know, I didn't want to go from having this huge piece of my life to having nothing, right? And so I was really conscious about um, ensuring a transition for me as a, as a human. So, you know, I had made the call I wanted to leave and I was really happy with that and I made the call I wanted to lean into my kids more, etc. And, you know, I've, I've done that. But I was also really conscious that me as a person, I needed um, another outlet. And fundamentally, I had been looking now from, you know, a long period of time at the growth of algorithms and uh, machine learning, etc., and that had led me to be fascinated about what was happening in AI. So most people think about AI as being very recent. Most people, you know, a lot of AI starts for them with ChatGPT last year. But in truth, you know, the hard study of AI has been happening for a long time. So um, I'm studying at Stanford. Stanford's, you know, um, artificial intelligence laboratory started in 1962, so, you know, there's been a lot of study here. Um, um, but I, because MBM worked closely with Google, I was aware of, so in 2017, um, a project that Google had, which was called Google Brain, they invented uh, a different technique. So a technique, if you like, for creating the, the brain, the digital brain, called a transformer. And the interesting thing about the transformer um, is that it um, was much better at working in paralyzation than other forms of deep learning that had existed, like Arnene and et cetera, so without boring everyone. What that meant was, because it could do things in parallel much better, you could feed it huge amounts of data that really you couldn't do before. And and I, I remember at the time going, wow, that's really interesting, but not thinking anything of it. And then, of course, what you then had is people actually doing that. So, you know, chat GPT, for those who don't know, the GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. So it's taking the transformer that Google Brain, the team there developed, and, and doing the thing that they prophesized you could do, pouring in data, pre-training it so it could become generative, um, and it just so happened those two things lined up. I left MBM in December. ChatGPT sort of exploded maybe the month before I left in November. And so that led me, you know, to go, right, you know, I should, because I was curious, continue to do it. So I'm currently, I'm not actually doing a degree. I'm currently just picking the papers on AI uh, out of Stanford and, and, and doing those because, you know, um, it's just the way I chose to do it. There are some really great programs there, though, if anyone's interested, where you can, you know, do all that stuff. But, um, yeah, so that that's what I'm doing at the moment. I'm loving it. I have my brain fried every single day. I go through, you know, the wave that everyone talks about. Some days I'm just amazed at the, um, the revolution and the opportunities that AI is going to drive in society, and other days I... Um, live in terror and and I completely want to you know put my head under the pillow on it. But yeah, I mean that that feels like the, the weirdly 
a rational place to to sit holding both those things. Uh, just just finally, if you were to kind of gaze into the future of this thing and think about how it it impacts the the media as it stands right now, or what what you think are not possible but likely um, impacts on for the for the people who work on the the sort of creation side as opposed to the the sort of distribution piece what 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 do you think we'll, we'll see there yeah well i mean going back to something i said way at the beginning which is you know if you think about this thing as art and science you know um why this is such a big shift and you know why i'm increasingly starting to think of it more like um, an industrial revolution size shift than, say, an iPhone size shift is because um, it fundamentally will change the systems and processes um, and functions, if you like, across that whole creative and media world. Like, it's, it's kind of easy as a media guy to understand how, you know, the AI will take over a lot of what the grunt processes in terms of, you know, tuning through you know, terabytes of data to to understand stuff. Where it gets harder for people, and maybe because, you know, it's the first great shock to white-collar roles, is the fact that I think, you know, the ability for it to be generative, so therefore take on some outward uh, appearances of creativity, um, really scares people. But I don't think actually they should be scared at all because, you know, an organic brain and a digital brain working in harmony the augmentation of human creativity uh, will be brilliant. It's not, I don't think, you know, everyone worries about it being one replacing the other. I think that's the wrong way to look at where we're at with large language models, particularly with generative AI. I actually think it's an amazing enhancement for the creativity of, of humans. So it's like having a whole agency studio at your fingertips. So if you have a great idea, you can get the AI to do 58, um, iterations of it, that, that's a capability that, you know, most creative people would have, you know, could only dream of having a whole studio at their, at their beckoning. At the moment, I think there's an element of fear, but I don't think they should be. Um, what's interesting is what does it mean for agencies? That's a much bigger question. I mean, where I sit on, where I sit on that at the moment is the honest truth is that um, agencies are not paid for the idea Agencies are paid by clients to execute the idea. So that creates a little bit of a, um, a worry in terms of if AI is doing more and more of the execution and that's how agencies are remunerated, that'll put stress on creative agencies in that regard. Um, on the flip side, though, I see actually a golden period of of the opportunity for creative people because large language models, generative AI, transformers themselves at the moment they are not good at understanding at all anything about human behavior or human culture so culture at large Um, and so you know creatives actually are really good at understanding that um, and trends that are shaping things so I think if if people can actually learn how they can actually augment um, their thinking processes with AI to do a lot of the actual grant and execution stuff Actually, it, it'll be really amazing. But I, I do foresee quite a reshaping of, of the whole skill set. But, I, you know, maybe I'm wrong on this. Um, I actually don't quite see uh, the mass sort of, you know, transitional event of everyone in marketing, for example, losing their job. I, I just don't see that. Um, it always will require a human to kind of make the the, the – interact with with the thing yeah yeah and then you know you know marketing is largely about influencing human behavior now ai large language models are not going to be able to do that 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 you know at the moment that 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 would be that would be madness to turn your marketing function over to an ai because large language models or generative ai they, they actually can't even understand the concept at this point in time so yeah Hey, um, Matt, thank you so much for, for that. It's it's such a fascinating view into the world, especially given the, the sort, of, uh, sort of multi-decade sweep of the thing. And, uh, yeah, really, really excited to, to see where it goes. And good to have, like, an optimistic note on it in an area that is often, uh, you know, can be quite terrifying for people. Oh, pleasure. 
That was The Fold, brought to you by our partners at O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O Media for sponsoring this episode of The Fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Kia ora e te iwi, te Ahe Butler here, podcast manager at The Spin-Off. If you enjoy listening to our podcasts, consider supporting our mahi by signing up to become a Spin-Off member at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.